Hi, I'm Steven Feinberg, Executive Director of the Rhode Island Film and Television Office. Our guest tonight is Melissa Tantaquidgian Zobel. She's a Mohegan Tribe author, historian, and medicine woman. And I welcome you to the set of Double Feature. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Stephen. It's an honor to be here. So, you are part of the Mohegan Tribe. Absolutely. Since birth. <laughs> Since birth. Uh, and you live in Connecticut. Right. Um, and here we are in Rhode Island. We're so close. Um, tell me about how you became a medicine woman. I think that's very interesting. Well, uh, I grew up in Mohegan Hill with my aunt Gladys Tantaquidgen and my uncle Chief Harold Tantaquidgen. And they ran the Tantaquidgen Museum, where I spent a lot of time. Is that the one that's the oldest museum in the United States? Absolutely. Tantaquidgen Museum uh, was founded in 1931, and it outdates all the other Indian-owned and operated museums in America. Wow. But uh, Gladys and Harold are extraordinary people, very active in the community. Uh, and Gladys was also famous for being an anthropologist and an herbalist. And so she knew a great deal about traditional remedies and also about our spiritual customs and traditions. So uh, she was a mentor to me. Um, of course, here in Rhode Island, you had someone very similar in uh, the Narragansett medicine woman, Alice Sikatau. Uh, she was also a friend of mine and uh, a mentor um, when I was growing up. So. Uh, you, you really had a lot of old timers with those traditions here in New England. And uh, being a medicine woman on the East Coast is a little different than maybe other parts of the country. Uh, we don't have a lot of the traditional plants where I live anymore, but we have been able to keep our stories and our spirituality and our customs. And uh, that's mostly what I work on. Can, can you talk a bit about the history of the Mohegan tribe? Oh, I would love to. Please, because uh, um, you're a storyteller. I, <laughs> you're you're Educate us. <laughs> Educate us. Well, the Mohicans are famous for having befriended the English, which was kind of an interesting choice in the 1600s. Uh, and we really had a tough decision to make because, you know, do we invite these people into our homes? Do we find a way to negotiate with them? Or do we fight? Do we fend them off? And Chief Uncas was the leader of the Mohicans in the 1600s. He's very famous for having decided to negotiate, use diplomacy, and befriend the English colonists. So that worked out actually quite well for our people for a long time because it meant that our neighbors had a very good relationship with us. We had always worked together. Um, our church, when it was founded, was opened on its first day with two native, two non-native uh, children baptized together. So uh, our tradition was one of collaboration and cooperation, and that's how we raise our children today to you know, really appreciate people from all different walks of life and to, to learn to get along. But of course, just like any people, the Mohegans have had some tough times. And uh, ours really were probably the toughest during the 17 and 1800s. Uh, you know, out west, uh, Native people encountered Europeans in different intervals, some more recently than us, much more recently. Mm -hmm. But here in New England, we're coming up next year on the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower. So we have 400 years of history. And we have some really great prominent people. We have Uncas, uh, we have Samson Ockham, who founded Dartmouth College. Mm -hmm. uh, and my personal favorite, uh, Fidelia Fielding, Flying Bird. People say she was one of the last speakers of our language, but she kept diaries and uh, she saved our language, despite the fact that school teachers in Connecticut and elsewhere in New England severely punished children with capital punishment for speaking indigenous languages in the, you know, 18th and 19th century and into the 20th century. So uh, she's my personal hero. Let's talk about her because you wrote yep, a screenplay. I on did. Her, and it was called Flying Bird's Diary. Yes. And you've won awards for it. Lots of awards, Lots yes. Of, <laughs> let's, let's talk about her. Let's talk about the script and then we'll talk about some of your other projects. But that, this is the most recent piece of art from you. Well, I'm very proud of Flying Bird's Diary because it really surprised me in the way people have resonated with this story. Uh, it's, I would call it an Eastern instead of a Western. You, know, you think of cowboys and Indians. We don't have cowboys and Indians here in the East Coast, right. but we do have Yankees and others and Indians. And so uh, Native people in the East Coast, we have our own stories. And just like out West, some are sad, some are funny. 
uh, and some are inspirational. And hers is an inspirational story. It's also a little funny and a little sad, too. Uh, Flying Bird was born in 1827, and she lived to 1908. Um, when she was a child, she lived on the Mohegan Indian Reservation, which was between two good-sized cities, the bustling, whaling port of New London and the textile center of Norwich, Connecticut. Uh, however, the Mohegan Indian Reservation in between was woods okay. <laughs> and isolated. She is encountering change all around her. Most of her fellow tribal people are, are going out maybe getting a job in Norwich or a job in New London. Not a great job, maybe the women are working as domestics or you know some other menial type job. But a lot of people were you know seamstresses, they would go out and they would find work. Uh, her grandmother didn't want that for her. She wanted her to learn about the woods, to learn the old ways. Um, she did go to school briefly. It went very badly because she was proud of her heritage and wanted to speak her language and see the world the old way. Um, but, but Flying Bird uh, still became kind of a role model for her people in a strange way, even though very few of them were keeping their language because they needed English to go work you know, off the reservation, um, they still admired her. And, and we do that today. We might have some family member, I think, who's old timey mm -hmm. with, with whatever country you're from. And maybe we're not like that person, but we still respect the fact that they maintain the traditions. that traditions, right? There's kind of one in every family right, just right. about who does that. And uh, her role for us was that. However, uh, some of the traditions she maintained, because they were spiritual traditions, were so foreign to people. Um, she taught us about the little people of the woods. Well, the little people of the woods uh, are not something that European people talked about here. They were very much a traditional Native American custom and story. And so she would be made fun of or abused for that kind of language off the reservation or among people who hadn't been raised with it. And sometimes maybe even her own because those, those beliefs start to fade over time. I mean, I don't, I know many countries in the world believe in little people, but how many people come to America and still believe in them? I don't know. Mm -hmm. So she had a really, uh, a lot of challenges in her life maintaining those beliefs. Fortunately, she had uh, a grandniece named Gladys Tantaquidgen, to whom she was able to pass on these stories and these beliefs, along with a very special belt um, that had been given to her by Martha Uncas many years earlier. So Gladys Tantaquidgen, who was my great aunt, who founded Tantaquidgen Museum, became her protege. And the only thing Gladys didn't pass on, though, was the language. And that language, she was afraid to pass on because she had been beaten as a child for speaking it, and she didn't want Gladys to suffer. But what she did do was she kept diaries. And the magic of those diaries is that years later, when it wasn't so fearful to speak it, we could use them to restore the language. And so that is something that we're, we're doing now with the help of uh, a linguist and Jessie Little Dobear of the Wampanoag is an amazing linguist. She's working on our language. And so Mohegan children are speaking Mohegan again. Uh, you wrote The Lasting of the Mohegans? Right, so that was actually uh, my first uh, full-length manuscript. And that was a really short form kind of tribal history. Yep. Um, but after that, I moved on to novels and uh, biographies and fiction. Okay. and. I'm kind of in love with fiction, I have to say. Uh, as much as I do like history, uh, I, I do like dramatized history. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not a documentary person so much, although I've done documentaries. Right. Uh, I feel that there, the, the artfulness that you can add sometimes in documentaries, I may not have that skill. I like doing it through narrative fiction. And so is that what Medicine Trail was? So Medicine Trail is, a, is really... It, the best way to describe it is the biography of Gladys Tantaquidgen. Okay. And I wrote that because Gladys lived from 1899 to 2005. She was 106 when she died. And her life really spanned the old Native world and the modern Native world. And I wanted to capture what that was like for her in her time and what she had seen. She was very funny. Gladys could adopt to just about, adapt rather, to just about anything, except the one thing she told me, you know, she'd seen 
you know, she'd seen cars and coming, then she'd seen television, she'd seen all these technology things. And she said, please don't talk to me about the internet. <laughs> ah, that's one more that thing. Was, that was it. That was, I can't I'm go, done. I'm, I'm done. done. <laughs> I can't go there. Um, what did she see? How did she, how did she see the world? Always positively. Anything that people said that uh, was in any way negative or hurtful was due to a misunderstanding. She truly believed that, uh, her favorite expression actually was, it's hard to hate someone you know a lot about. And she wanted to teach people about her culture. She wanted to learn about other people's cultures. And she raised uh, her people to want to do the same. Uh, her native name, um, which Flying Bird called her, as a child was everybody's grandmother. And that's a really interesting name because uh, she didn't have any children. Wow. Uh, she was really the grandmother of our people. Right. Wow. Um, you also wrote a book called Oracle? It's one of my favorites. Tell um, me about it. It's probably not the best written of my work, but it, it's one of my favorite stories. Uh, what inspired it? Uh, it's sci-fi, and it was inspired by the New Age movement of the 1990s and the idea that people were dipping into and experimenting with ancient spiritualities and uh, non-mainstream methods of connecting to spirits. And I extrapolated that out into the future a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was comparing it to people who come from cultures that have those things when they're responsible, say, to someone for how they present them. Like maybe you have to answer to an elder or you have to answer to a tribe or you have to answer to a village as opposed to people who are independent. Just, and just guardrails. And kind of, right, kind of go. Right, right. And, and that was what I was exploring uh, with oracles. Which shape is the Mohegan tribe in? It's a good question. Uh, w how do you see the future of the Mohegan tribe? How do you see it in our, with the different, I don't know. Mm, what do you, what do you? Where do I think we're going? Yeah. Well, it's really funny. When I was a, a little kid, uh, I wasn't sure we were going to go anywhere because we were um, not federally recognized yet. We had our wonderful museum. We had our culture. We had our elders. We had our sacred sites. But I really was concerned that we weren't doing enough to protect our culture. We didn't have any sort of... Uh, funding, we didn't have any reservation lands, and my fear was that, you know, over the generations things might fade. But during my youth, um, I worked hard on a project called Federal Recognition with, with most of the tribal leaders, and we were able to achieve that status, um, just as Narragansett achieved it here in Rhode Island. And, and uh, after that status, um, first of all, we had less invisibility among the general public. We'd always had our museum, but I remember it was very funny. Uh, I would I used to pick up the phone and I would answer it tribal office and and people would say travel office. Uh -huh. This is a t and they didn't they didn't. That's like Rhode Island and Long Island, that right? Was New York, right? And so they didn't they weren't associating a tribe with having an office. And it took years to kind of get people so that they they understood that. But now we're so fortunate because our young people, you know, they they have tribal camp, they have tribal lessons in dance They've and embraced culture and, and they not only have embraced it but they they don't see themselves as being on the fringe of going away or invisibility or extinction. extinction. Yes. And and that's a better way I think to grow up the way I grew up which was feeling like your fingernails were kind of hanging on wow. at all times. So um, I'm very proud of our young people. Uh, they ask questions that really stimulate conversation and make me rethink my silly old ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as Gladys Tanaquidgen always said, you know, maybe it's their time now. How's the Mohegan tribe different than like the Narragansett? Are there, are there differences? Yes. So it's interesting you ask that because in New England, at the time of contact with Europeans, we were all such close relatives that it's hard to kind of separate us. Um, Narragansetts were our cousins, Pequots and Mohegans were one tribe. Uh, Wampanoags were our cousins. We're all very closely related. Our languages are similar. Uh, and our cultures are extremely similar, you know, um, our, our art, our language, all those kinds of things. But each of us 
has our own story about the difficulties of that time, the 1600s. We all responded to it differently. Um, we, we all, since that time, have different uh, immigrant communities that have moved into our areas, you know, and that if that impacts the way you, you know, the way you see the world, the way you live also, different groups in different areas. Uh, some of us, you know, our reservations have shrunk or have changed in some way, so we're maybe it weren't as coastal as we once were, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Uh, so each tribe has evolved differently, uh, and yet we, we share a common experience of survival, and uh, I think a very deep love of New England, which as you said, you know, your love of Rhode Island, our love of this place, it couldn't possibly be any deeper. Well, that is a perfect way to wrap us up. I want to thank you, Melissa, so much for your work, your storytelling, your uh, love of your culture and sharing it with us. And I want to thank you so much for coming to the set of Double Feature and sharing it with our audience. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure.